So before I start this episode of Damien's Market Update, don't forget to hit that like button if you find this video useful or interesting in any way as it helps our channel. And also don't forget to subscribe to the channel and you'll be notified of future episodes of this show as well as the other stuff that we do on the channel. Now, the show is aimed at anybody who is investing, whether they're active or passive. What it's really doing is explaining to people why their portfolio is doing what it's doing and in that way they may more well they're much more likely to stay the course over the long term so if you thought that august was bad for your portfolio then september was even worse and lived up to its billing as the worst month of the year for stock market returns now just to recap we entered september after bearish sentiment took hold of equity markets once again as that summer equity rally that we'd experienced collapsed into nothing more than yet another bear market rally in 2022. Now, if you take the S&P 500 as an example, after rallying towards its 200-day moving average in August, it collapsed in a heap and headed back towards 3,900 at the start of September as investors realised that they'd misjudged the supposed Fed pivot. So that was where the market started to bet that the US Federal Reserve would be much more dovish, i.e. cut or not hike interest rates as quickly and ultimately end up possibly cutting them sooner rather than later. Well, after getting that wrong, we saw the weakest August performance for US stocks since 2015, and that was swiftly followed by the worst September since 2002. Now, as I've mentioned, September is historically the weakest month of the year for most equity markets. And history suggested that for the S&P 500, we were always likely to see a fall of around 1%. But what we got in September 2022 was a fall of 9% on the S&P 500. Now, ultimately, it meant, as suggested in my last video, the index revisited its June low of 3666, but went on to set a new low for 2022 at 3585 on the 30th of September. That slump in September took the S&P 500's year-to-date performance to a fall of more than 25%, which is well into the bear market definition. Now, equity market carnage was not just isolated to the US, it was global in fact. And during September, just to illustrate the point, the MSCI All Countries Asian X Japan index fell over 10%, the MSCI EM index, that's the emerging market equivalent, fell 9.5%, the all countries index from MSCI was down 8.6%. Now, that gives you a broad idea of what global equity markets were doing. The Nikkei 225 was down 7.6%, the DAX down 5.61%, and the FTSE 100 was the relative outperformer at 5.36%. Now, in last month's video, I highlighted how the pound fell more than 4.5% against the dollar during the month of August. And that was the worst monthly performance since the Brexit referendum in 2016. This put the pound at a 37 year low against the US dollar, which actually was very positive for my own 50k portfolio, which I run live on my 8020 investor subscription service. There's always a link in the show notes below that you can go and find out more about that and try a free trial if you want to. Now in September, the pound fell even further, crashing another 8% down towards one dollar and three cents, which was an all-time low for the dollar pound exchange rate. So that's a another currency kick for my own portfolio and those of you who also had some exposure to a weaker pound. But it wasn't just a strong US dollar story. It was a UK economic crisis story. So it meant the pound fell against pretty much every other currency you care to think of, giving a nice boost to any overseas assets that you have when they're converted back into pounds. Now, it meant that your portfolio would be insulated from the worst of the overseas market falls, but obviously not all of them. Now, a good example of that is the S&P 500, because if you take account of the weakness in the pound, well, it reduced that 9% loss that I mentioned earlier for the month of September, and it brought that down to a loss of 5.4%. Now, that's still pretty appalling, but it's better than it could have been otherwise. Now, what caused September's carnage? Well, in the first half of the month, much had to do with the US dollar index, which hit a new 20 year high. Now, 
A strong dollar not only tends to hit US stocks, but also commodities, especially gold, as well as proving a headwind for Asian emerging markets. In contrast, a strong dollar versus the Japanese yen tends to be positive for the Nikkei 225, while a weaker pound versus the stronger US dollar can provide some support for the FTSE 100, which we saw given its relative outperformance in September. Now, all of that and the movements in the US dollar index goes a long way to explaining many of the market moves we saw in early September. But it also has explained many of the moves throughout this year, especially since the mid part of June when we had that rally and then the pullback, obviously, we saw in August into September. But it's never a given just because the dollar goes up and down, sometimes assets don't behave quite as you think they should. Now, in the second half of September, things changed. It wasn't all about the dollar. A bit of seasonality came into effect as well, because the second half of September historically is always much weaker than the first half. Now, that's pretty bad, given that September's a pretty dire month anyway. So we inevitably saw a turn lower. And that catalyst that caused that turn lower was initially a number of central banks, including the Bank of England and the US Federal Reserve, raising interest rates, which obviously caused bond yields to spike. It also caused the yield curves to invert. That's around the globe. Remember, yield curve inversions that I've talked about before on this show are a good indicator of a potential recession in the future in that particular domestic economy. So the bond market weakness fed into equity markets, as you'd expect. So investors were already nervous. But then we got the UK Chancellor giving his now infamous mini budget. And what was held as the biggest tax cut in 50 years prompted markets to sort of recoil in horror. Now, the scale of the required government borrowing to deliver his plan sent shockwaves throughout gilt markets. Now, gilt's are essentially loans to the UK government. Now, gilt yields saw their biggest one-day jump on record with the five-year gilt yield breaking above 4.7%, having started the day of the mini-budget at around about 3.5%. And that was because concerns grew over how the UK government will actually finance its stimulus plans. Now, the market's vote of no confidence in the UK was reflected in the value of the pound as well, which plummeted ultimately to that all-time low against the US dollar that I mentioned earlier. Now, that jump in gilt yields that I've mentioned might not sound a lot, but it is because that is the sort of move you'd see in maybe months or years to actually pan out. We saw that happen in a matter of days. And so that caused repercussions and shock waves to go throughout government bond markets around the world. And that ultimately caused stock markets to pull back. In the UK, we saw the mortgage market basically freeze up with 40% of deals actually pulled. And we even saw pension funds come close to becoming insolvent because of the collapse in the value of the gilts that they were holding. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of how and why, but it meant that the Bank of England, which does have an inflation mandate that I talk about a lot on this particular show, but it also has a mandate to ensure financial stability in markets. So basically, the markets are functioning properly. So they had to step in to the UK gilt market. They had to backstop it effectively by promising to buy unlimited amounts. If there's actually there is a limit on a daily basis, and that limit is around about five billion pounds, but they haven't put an end date to that whole program. Essentially, the Bank of England, by promising to buy gilts to be able to keep a lid on the yield, caused QE to start again. So that is an an unusual situation that we are now in. So on the one hand, we've got the Bank of England raising interest rates, but at the same time, they're also starting quantitative easing again. Now, raising interest rates tends to quell inflation, but ironically, starting QE again tends to increase inflation. Now, you can debate whether it's actually QE or not. If it looks like QE, then it pretty much is. The market has taken it as the Bank of England has pivoted to a much more dovish stance, and that's been forced upon it. Now, in a world where most central banks are racing to tighter monetary policy, the Bank of England has effectively blinked first. Now, it raises the question as to whether we are now seeing the start of central banks pivoting to more accommodative monetary policy. And by that, I mean not raising rates anymore, potentially cutting rates, but also starting to introduce things like QE. 
If it is, then that could signal the bottom of the market. Don't forget, if you go back to the 23rd of March 2020, that was at the depth of the pandemic, then the US Federal Reserve entering the market, supporting it through measures like QE, actually was the bottom of the market. And from that point on, the equity markets kicked on and the rest is history. We had a huge bull market. Now, are we going to see the same again? And certainly as we enter October, equity markets, fresh from their 2022 lows, have exploded higher. Give an example, the S&P 500 has leapt more than 5% in the first two trading days of the month. That is the best start to a month on record, as investors bet that the US Federal Reserve will now follow the Bank of England's lead and pivot to more accommodative monetary policy. Now, we saw similar powerful moves right across equity markets around the globe. But is this rally sustainable? Now, I don't know whether it is or whether it isn't. I don't think anybody really does. But the best way perhaps of describing it is that equity markets have been here before. If you go back to the July period into August, then the market was trying to front run a pivot by central banks, meaning they were going to go from tight, hawkish monetary policy to that more accommodative, dovish monetary policy. We're at that stage again. So they're betting that the pivot has already happened or is about to happen. And of course, we have to then think back to what happened last time. Well, we know it ended up being another bear market rally and we then went down to new lows for 2022. It doesn't mean that we're going to see that now, but bear it in mind. The thing is, you don't have to be first in calling a market bottom. In fact, you never have to really call a market bottom. You just have to be right. So when the trend starts and continues, then you can take advantage of it then. Now, I've done that using 8020 Investor for all the seven years I've been running my portfolio. And as I often mention, it's best to be right rather than first. Now, of course, seasonality has been playing a big part in markets of late. And the good news is that October is seasonally a positive month for equity markets. And also, we start going in towards that Christmas run-in, which again is positive for equity markets. And of course, we'll be talking about the Santa rally later in the year. So right now, it feels like we've had a hurricane in equity and bond markets and even currency markets in September. And we've now come out the other side in the relative calm. We're seeing things starting to stabilise. But the question really is, is the storm gone or are we just in the eye of the hurricane and the worst is yet to come? We won't know for now. We'll have to look what's going to happen in the days and weeks ahead. And one headwind that could be on the horizon is obviously we're going to start getting earnings reports again soon as we enter the next earnings season. And has the market factored in the disappointment that we might get during that earnings season, we'll have to wait and see. So that is it for this month's show. As ever, if you've enjoyed that, found that useful, please hit that like button and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. And also ask questions in the comments section and I'll do my very best to get back to you and answer those for you. So until next time. Whoa.